न्यूज फर्स्ट फेस टू फेस विद जयमाल रत्नायक A very good evening and welcome to a brand new edition of Face to Face coming to you direct from our News First studios here in Colombo as always for the News First team I am Jayma Ratnayaka tonight on Face to Face we have two guests in our studios who are no strangers to the show however they always bring valuable insight in heard president Rajapaksa Vikram Singh making during the UN peace May Day rally in Maligaon yesterday where he said that he felt happy on the way to the May Day rally in Maligaon because he saw so many parades so many flags of other parties being erected and uh, May Day rallies being held across the country and that is a true sign of democracy and i personally wanted to speak to my guest today as to whether that is in fact a symbol of democracy or is there a space for democracy to grow further here in sri lanka we can maybe start off with dr sarun muthu this evening well that there are many meetings and processions and all parties are able to uh, celebrate mm. uh, may day is of course yes it is a expression a demonstration of the pluralism of our democracy but we have a lot of shortcomings beyond that mm. you know we have a lot of shortcomings in terms of the civil and political rights the online safety bill the projected anti terrorism act possibly legislation to deal with non governmental organizations so there are a number of things that really need to be rectified mm. if you like yes but sure that there are many rallies in this country and that all parties are able to celebrate mm. yes this is it's a salutary sign that yes democracy is there but it needs further development certainly so mr gajnaik would you like to add anything to what doctor said yeah actually i mean it is no it is not a strange thing i mean uh, we are celebrating uh, yesterday actually mm. we celebrated that uh, 138th uh, may day rally yes. you know in the in the global context mm. then as dr sarah said actually yes it is a, it is a symbol of uh, people participation uh, as well as actually a number of loopholes mm. within that i mean you know that the the one of main pillars of for i mean if you need to, you need to have a healthy democracy you need elections okay now if you can look back what has happened almost two elections have been de- almost disappeared mm. okay no provincial council elections no local government elections then uh, incumbent president ranil mr ranil wickremesinghe saying that uh, when he said that actually uh, actually i would like to uh, remember you that actually in 2017 actually they uh, introduced a new bill Uh, to demarcate uh, electorates as well as introduce new uh, mm. election law election method to provincial council elections after that what has happened actually no provincial council elections even right now then almost it is almost near 2 years mm. actually no local government election the main i mean the main responsible person is the execu- executive president now actually he can be happy uh he can be more happy but unfortunately uh you can't be happy just just seen um, just like those symbols no you just have elections okay then it is a basic rights people participation and and as a as a citizen mm. actually you should have a, a take part in, take participate mm. to uh, governance process of mm. the country election is a one of prominent thing but unfortunately actually even that uh, yes according to the constitution constitution of sri lanka uh, presidential election will be held but still uh, people have some uh, doubt on their minds mm. no it is not uh, it is not a part of held democracy then uh, though we celebrated uh, may day yesterday actually uh, still we need to do we need to do more homework the basic thing is actually having periodic and genuine elections on time hmm. so dr sarun muthu mr gajnayak brought up the fact of having a healthy democracy and having a healthy democracy i believe also relates to ensuring that the laws and regulations in this country are followed to the book and the constitution of sri lanka we know has sometimes been discounted to a mere piece of paper by the political establishment time and time again so i believe is it not the right time for a new social contract to be enacted and how important is such a contract in this context to sri lanka absolutely the current the social contract that we have is in pieces mm. 
there is no institution that functions under it as it's supposed to. The processes too have been corrupted mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So we need a new constitution as the overarching law within which you provide a framework for everything else. Now, I mean, I, I've always believed that the one institution that needs to be got rid of mm. is the executive presidency. Right. Because of the concentration of power in it and, you know, the executive president, as the first executive president said, all you could do was change the sex of someone. Mm. Now, corruption is a major issue in the country. Now, when you think about it, the president, the executive president, appoints the secretaries to ministries. Yes. The secretaries to ministries are the chief financial officers of those ministries. Mm. So they're appointed by an executive president. They do his bidding. There is no mm. check or accountability as such with regard to the way they work. So we need a new social contract in this country to address serious challenges that we have, but most importantly, to restore the legitimacy of government. Hmm. You see, what we have is a curious situation at the present moment. Parliament has lost its legitimacy. The president was selected by a parliament that has lost its legitimacy. legitimacy. So we need to renew that, and that's why the call for elections is very, very strong. If there is any attempt elections, my suspicion is, is that you will have another type of aragale, mm. you know. So elections are, must always be seen as, and they are, mm. the most basic process for choice and change mm. in a democracy. When you take into account the economic aspect of things, at least on the surface, the government steering the country into somewhat calmer waters, at least from the information that we have available. But when it comes to the socio-democratic aspect of things, we do not see any sort of please, significant progress being made by the part of the government. So what do you believe, at least until election season arrives, the president led by, uh, the government led by the president should do to ensure that the, the social democratic <coughs> angle is also uplifted in Sri Lanka? Well, I've always believed that governments need to consult people. Right. There is to be a conversation mm. between ruler and rule, mm. as it were. And the United National Party, I think, is very deficient in this, right. particularly where it is an extreme situation. We are talking about major changes both economically, hopefully politically and constitutionally as well. Mm. And you can't have those major changes without having this conversation mm. with the people. So, I mean, as a consequence of that, the government is being criticized for lacking empathy, mm. for lacking sensitivity. Now, I don't know whether there is enough time for them to rectify it, but they need to go out to the people and explain, mm. you know, where they're taking us, yes. all of that. So, Mr. Gazdanayaka, speaking of that and along those lines, the introduction of a national policy for various sectors in this country, be it agriculture, be it tourism, be it education, has been put forward every now and then. But we don't see anything materializing. And that has led to successive governments coming forward, reneging on a previous government's progress or promises they had made implementing their own decisions and their own functions and features. So can you just speak to us about how important it is to introduce national policies into Sri Lanka's governance system in ensuring that whatever progress is made by a certain government, should it be overturned, is still continued regardless of who is in power? Yeah, actually we are lack of uh, introducing uh, national policies in uh, I mean, uh, years and uh, decades of uh, in in the country. Mm. You know, it is starting with the election manifestos. Mm. Okay, then you know that the what has happened to the previous uh, executive president, Mr. Gotabe Rajpaksha, actually that he also tried to put forward uh, the uh, proposal with uh, introducing uh, uh, organic, organic fertilizer, fertilizer mm. to the whole country. But if you can see carefully, actually, the, the what has ha what has included in the election manifestos of SLP. PP actually they they have included that 
they are introducing that uh, organic fertilizer in step by step not to the whole country mm. but according to the some of advisors actually uh, he misguided everyone that's why he actually he's there now then that if we can select some of very very uh, i mean critical subject areas mm. education agriculture especially youth in 2011 and 12 with the partnership with the uh, open university actually at that time uh, youth ministry mm. started to introduce in a youth policy right. unfortunately still it is in the discussion I okay see. now that agricultural policy also like that most of various can, various things if you can forget all oh, everything let's say let's think on the foreign ministry mm. okay now last jahapalana government okay i counted actually for uh, one of my research uh, areas then uh, 43 persons have been appointed as political appointees to the uh, foreign embassy oh, even see. right now that is happening mm. okay some of most various mo- most uh, prominent singers are appointed as ambassadors mm. to some countries mm. okay but unfortunately the thing is that there is a privilege com- uh, that the parliamentary committee to appoint that mm. unfortunately parliamentary committee also given their appoint the uh, approval for that mm. then then everything can start i mean there was discussion also in last week also peferal also started that uh, i mean convene a discussion to whether to see in the whether legal whether they can le- uh, whether uh, whether legal then mm. can legalize mm. the election manifestos right okay but unfortunately i don't think that we can legalize because uh, most of political ide- ide- ideologies mm. around but at least when they are propose in some of uh, suggestions mm. there should be a measurement benchmarks okay now if you can see that uk and german in finland mm. most of countries at, at least they have a budget office mm. okay when you are put forward in, uh, when you are submitting your budget proposal not budget actually the election manifestos mm. they are comparing with the budget mm. okay but unfortunately we don't have such mechanism right the important is that when you are proposing some kind of mechanism it should be comparing with the annual budget right but in sri lanka you can't you can't uh, see such a public officials mm. but unfortunately there's no proper way to do that mm. then whatever the government in place okay then you should have a uh, national policy but unfortunately it ca- you can start it through a uh, through an election manifesto right. but it is our procedures which if they're properly implemented will uh, forefront meritocracy but the the issue here is this is, is that you have laws but they're not implemented mm. you know and people get away with violating the law with impunity 
how does one eliminate that whole question of political connection? Well, I mean, I think you should ask an ordinary citizen, mm. if they have a problem, will they look for someone who is politically connected or powerful to short circuit the process? Of Same. course they will. Mm -hmm. Of course they would. So in that respect, the problem is with us. Mm. We like to take shortcuts. Yes. You know, and until someone is apprehended in doing that mm. and shown that they've been using undue influence to get what they want or whatever, however just it might be, it's the wrong way of doing things, I think this will continue. You know, I, a lot of our problems, I think, stem from our society. Mm. We blame the politicians, but of course the politicians come from us, you know, yes. come from us. And the thing is, is that, I mean, you know, if you take basically the school system even in this country. Yes, to know, enroll a, a child into a school. Yeah, and mm. there's a two mile radius or whatever it is, and everyone within that two mile radius can send their child to a particular school. Mm. But we all know they're coming from all over the country. You know, for example, you know, if there's a two mile radius, Ananda and Ananda, they will have a number of Muslims. Definitely. I don't think they have any. Mm. So, sticking to the same topic, people needing to have someone who has authority to get something done here in Sri Lanka. And one reason I feel like politicians get away scot free is because they have that authority and the people of Sri Lanka for the longest <coughs> time have somewhat revered politicians as if they are spiritual beings and they can perform wonders, which is somewhat a a counterpoint because the people are the very the people are the ones who elect them into power places of power and they thereafter disregard the people so like you said how do the people go about changing their mindset instigating the change that a politician is a public representative and should be held accountable for any wrongdoing i think as with all things it should start with the system of education right you know, when I was in school, we had something called civics, mm. where you learnt about how to, what, what it was to be a citizen in a functioning democracy. I don't think you have that anymore. If you instill that at an early age, and you say that, look, you study hard, you get a degree, you get a job, mm. you have therefore the right to feel that you can be promoted and reach the top, etc., that meritocracy is the key, mm. the way to get ahead rather than connections. Because the point about connections, the only defense about connections could be, I remember when Mind Rajpaksa appointed Gothabe Rajpaksa his defense secretary. Mm. And there were a whole number of other appointments in that government that were part of the Rajpaksa family. Mm. I remember asking someone, you know, isn't this disgraceful? I mean, you know, all the state has been captured mm. by a family. And they turned around and said to me, specifically with regard to Gotabe's defense secretary, look, we're in a war. Mm. The president needs people he can trust. Who better to trust? Their family. Than his family. <laughs> but it goes to show they represent 22 million people in this country exactly. and it's not just a family. So, Mr. Gajanak, I want to pick your brain also on uh, what you think about what we were talking about in terms of... Uh, meritocracy and also the people changing their mindset first that you shouldn't need political affiliations or a connection to get something done how the people can themselves be the catalysts for the change that we ourselves seek yeah the thing is actually uh, that you know that i'm representing march 12 movement also mm. once we started to uh, introduce that scorecard scorecard system as well as uh, some of criteria okay we introduced some of uh, eight criteria actually mm. when, whether they are corrupted mm. uh, okay that uh, biased uh, and like that but unfortunately you know i don't think that uh, we had uh, we had made more results that it is a gradual process yes. no? that uh, we can't make miracles mm. but unfortunately the the thing is that the con this country okay that there's a tradition okay that the nepotism is there if you can see that recently i re make made a i mean uh, i did a research for hambantota district in Ham uh, the election we have 16 parliamentary election from 1947 to uh, 2020 mm. okay in between 
except except 19 uh, 1977 mm. all other election in hambantota district there is a person from rajapaksha family right. okay and not only not only one person mm. most of times lakshman rajapaksha george rajapaksha like those two persons in other other times mm. actually i am not talking only one family yes. this is a pattern of mm. in sri lankan politics yes. okay in other times maybe uh, mahindra rajapaksha chamal rajapaksha nirubama mm. rajapaksha like that in last time also actually that the chamal rajapaksha and namal rajapaksha in last election mm. mahindra rajapaksha mr mahindra rajapaksha went to kurunagal district because otherwise actually they will lost the one of family Major members votes, yes. the the thing is as dr sara mentioned mm. actually that the the thing is that people still voting no then uh, still they they need uh, toilet facilities mm. still they need food mm. no still they need uh, some of basic fa- facilities mm. but still they are voting mm. that is the thinking pattern of voting uh, voters electors no then you need to have political literacy not elect uh, that election literacy you know mm. electoral that you know how to put ballots okay. no you to uh, how to mark the ballots mm. but unfortunately you don't have political literacy that mm. is the most important part what en- encompasses political yes. literacy then if you can more i mean as Do- dr sara correctly mentioned actually mm. if you can include into the education policies that even dinesh gunavardhana committee reports even almost two two reports as well as some of uh, recommendations made by organizations like uh, pfral cmev and other organization mm. actually one of prominent suggestion is that that the that providing promote civic education mm. including uh, electoral literacy okay into the uh, basic education system mm. but still not uh, upgraded right that's the most uh, important thing i see so we are in conversation with dr parker so this arvana muttu and also mr manjula gazanayaka stay tuned to face to face we will be right back after the short commercial break news first face to face with jamal ratnayaka fulfill your dream of studying in the uk mr tripathi the sanasil leena denna puluwa mona da ata karanna one kiyanna ko olu thuwala velada mama hondin nemi inne me kiwa benda vitarai kollage jeevitheta hena ura labuwa me sari mama ona wattanna kaata wadda habe mama inna kan oya age paligenim nisa deweni putawat nathi wenna denne naha kohida yanne poda vinoda wenna yanawa kaani wala ekak thiyenawa enawada yanna i don't care Every Saturday and Sunday at 8:30 p.m. Tune in to Shakti TV. Fulfill your dream of studying in the UK. Cuz when we take a loan or when any loan is been taken, we automatically go into a evaluation point. The sex absence of any knowledge with regard to sexual education. Now, those two are key pillars, transparent ways of showing Uh, how money is spent we are doing women when the ltt was in operation when there was actually a civil terrorism issue going on in the country we didn't have these laws then the question is why do we need these laws so this has brought down the total gdp by about 25% in dollar terms which was around 90 billion now it's around now hovering around 70 billion there are particular focus areas that i think evolve um, based on the binational commission so like the self esteem is really really low like they don't believe anymore okay i can do something about that so anymore there's no any decision making about that and very passive it regards to state land so i think this will carry huge repercussions for the future fulfill your dream of studying in the uk
దన్నో కొచ్చిన బెన్న అనమాట ఆదరే కేలు మందన్న ఆదరే కవదవా తడువింది నా కేలు Fulfill your dream of studying in the UK. Every Saturday and Sunday at 8:30 p.m. Tune in to Shakti TV. News first, face to face with Jamal Ratnayaka. Welcome back to Face to Face. We are in conversation with Dr. Pakesh Sodhi Sarwar Muttu and Mr. Mansur Ratnayaka. Before the break, we discussed the socio-economic and socio-democratic aspect of uh, Sri Lanka. how it can be improved what state it is in right now but i now want to shift my attention to another burning topic that has been thrown around quite a lot in th- the past few days or months which is the election elections in sri lanka have always been uh, a very divisive topic especially because of the number of rhetoric that is built around those every time there is an election this year or rather this particular election more particularly the presidential election which has been constitutionally mandated to be held this year is somewhat dubious because although many political parties have come forward and made their own estimations on when the presidential election will be held or if it will be a parliamentary election that will precede a presidential election the election commission has been very tight lipped regarding any possible election so i want to first ask dr sarvan muttu Why do you think the election commission has been very very silent regarding any sort of election do you not think that it should come forward and explain to the people offer a clarification to the people as to what a possible timeline is on an election what election can be held and so on well as far as the presidential election is concerned it's constitutionally determined it mm. has to be between september and october i think 17th of september yes. yeah yeah you know so I don't think that the commission feels that it has to come out and sort of say mm. such and such but when the time is right where the stipulated periods of nominations and all of that they will come out and and do their job mm. the speculation of course was with regard to the general election and I think from March of last year the president was able to dissolve, dissolve parliament yes. and that is his prerogative mm. quite frankly the constitution allows the president to uh, you know have that prerogative unless of course there is a vote of no confidence and the government is toppled as a consequence mm. of that so you know the election commission i think you know has its work cut out for it we know that it has to be between september mm. and october and one hopes that everything will be fine as the far as that goes followed but the issue of course is with regard to the other elections okay. the local government elections the provincial council elections and i think you know 
there isn't a sufficient culture of devolution mm. because people I think think that look the important elections are the national elections yes you know the other ones are not that important and therefore we sh you know don't need to make a noise about them but any infringement on the exercise of the franchise must be taken seriously mm. because it's a sort of slow process of unraveling what I said to you earlier, the basic mechanism of choice and change is elections, you know. So in that respect, I think the Election Commission could have done more, mm. and indeed all of us could have done more. But I think that as far as a presidential election is concerned, I think we will have it. Mr. Gazanayaka, what is your opinion? Yeah, same as actually as while approving what uh, Dr. Sarah is correctly mentioned actually that the thing is that the uh, election commission now you know that most uh, people are talking many things on mm. elections but I mean at least in this moment election commission can do one thing it is appointing a, a spokesperson no mm -hmm. actually they can tell something and 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 also if you can see the website of election commission actually they don't have uh, mentioned uploaded anything related to elections so some speculations are there mm. but at least actually they can say what is their uh, stance mm. on current situation especially on local governments now local still you know Jamal that we are passing, we are living in an active election campaign period. Nice. This local government campaign period. Mm. Okay? Now, you know that the uh, nearly 3,000 government, uh, government officers, public servants have given their nominations to, to elections. Mm. Due to that, still they don't have a chance to work on their work, work in work place. places. Mm. Okay? Now, actually, they have moved to nearby places. Mm. Due to that, I, I met uh, one of uh, teachers mm. that uh, she's teaching actually in Mathra area. She's in a, uh, she was teaching in a Muslim schools. Okay. Okay? Muslim school. She was she was the uh, only one mm. teacher teaching Sinhala language. Due to that, she uh, submitted her nomination. Due to that, actually, she has uh, transferred to another school. Still, she's there. Then that uh, that those uh, Muslim children mm. students don't have any teacher to listen actually uh, learn uh, Buddhism and Sinhala. Mm. That's the that is the thing. Then at least election commission took take the, uh, take, take the stand that that I know that we know that the parliament only can cancel nominations. Mm. At least election commission then pre pressurized to do that, but still they actually tight lip. And the other thing is, you know, that there's a widespread thing that the distribution of rice, mm. 10 kilos of rice, as well as giving some jobs opportunities and under the pa uh, under the ministries mm. of uh, foreign affairs, right. as well as they are giving uh, deeds, mm. permanent deeds yes, for 2 million deeds. people, mm. 2 million people. According to the our current existing laws, that campaign finance law, you can you can co you can cover only the campaign pi campaign fi campaign period right. it may be 60 or 65 days okay. but out of that period you can't cover but still though you can't cover actually we have election com election organizations mm -hmm. actually monitoring missions actually we have sent our complaints to election commission at least they should have sent their i mean tell what is their stand on these issues mm -hmm. that that people actually that election uh, that the government still using they have spent I mean the current government's already spent four thousand and six hundred millions to distribute uh, rice yes. I mean as I I mean uh, I'm, I'm not telling that it, it is not suitable mm. I, I mean yeah. but they are distributing uh, rice mm. 10 kilo of rice among 27 and 40 to uh, 27 lakhs mm. 2.7 million, million families okay. we have only 50 uh, uh, 5.5 uh, million families in the country that mean all of 2.7 million now under the poverty line mm. no there's no any basic uh, ba basic baseline research mm. done uh, by uh, government yet then there there are some doubts mm. then at least uh, election commission should have to do that that means the problem is that 
acts they have established under the executive president okay though they have appointing the i mean appointing appointing uh, authorities constitutional council under the recommendation of executive president is appointing mm. what has happened to the last election commission mm. then they, they they have tried merely to do the conduct the local government election they showed uh, what has happened actually they mm. uh, at least uh, uh, end of the day yes. they they had to resign mm. from the job okay but this this time they know that current commission members know if they are confronting at least they start something to do on these elections and they made some docu uh, statements mm. then the, the result will be vicious right. that's the thing certainly so dr sarumuthu at the start of uh, the show you expressed that you are for the abolition of the executive presidency let's assume that whoever comes to power following this presidential election decides to move ahead with it what do you believe is the best governance structure for sri lanka beyond executive presidency well i hope that the new president will seriously consider constitutional reform and bring mm. in a new constitution now we need a head of state mm. right and i think the head of state should be selected by an electoral college mm. made up of the members of parliament we should have a second upper chamber right. or second uh, house mm. and provincial councils right. as well mm. so you have provincial councils where well, let's for conversation say call it a senate mm. and the house of representatives okay. should elect that president now that president will have certain powers that may not well might seem like sort of executive powers and that is of course in a situation in which you have a close election calling upon an individual to form a government or okay. that kind of thing right. would be within the president's powers mm. powers then should be transferred to parliament mm. and the prime minister should be the head of government who will then determine the number of cabinet positions and all of that mm. that's what i would like to see as a structure overall structure of governance mm. we need a president but not an executive president right so in terms of uh, empowering provincial councils if we talk about the 13th amendment to the constitution and so on if a new constitution is brought forward what sort of powers should provincial councils be handed down okay the criticism of the current system of devolution is that each province has a governor mm. who is appointed by the president yes and at the end of the day nothing can happen in the province without the governor's consent Concept. or concurrence mm. secondly you have three lists mm. a national list a provincial list and a concurrent list okay now the problem with the concurrent list of course is this is that it is more or less sort of hijacked by the central government yes, yes. and therefore the provinces do not have much of a say mm. I think it's important to have a concurrent list because there are certain things that the provinces and the central government needs to work on mm. but it has to be done in a way that each one's integrity and spheres of confidence are properly preserved and defended mm. so in addition to those kinds of changes with regard to concurrency and with regard to the appointment of governors I think those in the north and east would argue that look The 13th amendment has land powers and police, police powers, powers as well yes and they have yet to be devolved anywhere in mm. the country yes and we need to have a further conversation of, as to whether we can go even further mm. because you know at the end of the day the point about devolution etc is that people who are directly affected by these decisions should be allowed to make those decisions mm. if they cannot for any reason then it should go to a higher level the principle of subsidiarity yes you know and that should obtain across the country certainly so mr gajanayake elections are going to be trending quite a lot this year not just in sri lanka but the world over we know the lok sabha elections in india the yeah. largest democracy in the world the elections uh, commenced a few weeks back will end in june we know that the united states will have its presidential election and there are elections in south africa and several other uh, south american countries as well so what sort of an effect will global elections on a global standpoint have here in sri lanka 
Yes, uh, actually, according to some of uh, global some of global reports, there are uh, 64 elections to be held in uh, this year. worldwide. Yeah, yeah, this year. Half the world is voting. Yes, yes, <laughs> half the world <laughs> actually, and also that prominent elections. Not I mean, uh, mm. if uh, if you if you are adding some subnational government, maybe nearly 100 elections, mm. but most of as you correctly mentioned India and uh, South Africa as well as especially America mm. yes uh, nearly uh, 64 uh, national elections most of election now it seems we are living in a global village it is not a doubt not an any doubt actually yeah it is so important and critical mm. the most important thing you know that my uh, personal understanding is that the critical is the it is more sensitive because we don't have any proper national policies in mm. place okay especially foreign policies like that if you don't have such a stable policies when changing some governments some critical governments okay some some of maybe india uh, china mm. okay that uh, especially in governments the America, that have a vested yeah. interest in sri lanka yes mm. Actually, it is so affecting to Sri Lanka. I mean, it is the it is not affecting me. Actually, it is the art of relationship and also the partnership. That's why it is, if you can't make a permanent uh, policy, policy, then that can be affected. Mm. I mean, the any election, any changing of uh, leaders, actually, those are such big countries actually can be affected. But I personally think in that most affecting thing is actually that we don't have any <laughs> basic policies. Mm. That's the most important thing. So historically and to now, we have followed a non-aligned policy and we were the champions of it when it comes to international relations. But in recent times, we have seen the, the non-aligned policy somewhat blurring when it came to decisions that the current government made. So how important, uh, Mr. Sarun Mutta, I want to venture off into that realm as well. How important is it for any government that comes into power to ensure that Sri Lanka's integrity and its sovereignty is protected regardless of what sort of wh any assertion that is made by superpowers of the world, namely either India or China of the United States, how important is it that we maintain a robust foreign policy? No, it's very important that we maintain a robust foreign policy because of the Indo-Pacific, the interest in this region, the Indo-Pacific region, Sri Lanka has a pivotal role to play. We are sort of sandwiched between India and China mm. in terms of the sort of global balance of power. But, you know, last week, for example, we had the Iranian president mm. visit. We had a leading member of the Chinese Communist Party visit. We had the head of the Russian land forces mm. visit. We had, I think, well, apart from the ITC hotels being opened, mm. we had people coming to, to do the Ra uh, Ravana trails or yes, whatever, yes. you know. So when you look at it in that respect, we have entertained everyone. Mm. And we had an American uh, US uh, naval exercise. Oh, yes, characters. Sort. Yeah. Mm. So we have entertained everyone. Now, we haven't molded that mm. into a proper foreign policy doctrine. Now, people talk about non-alignment. I mean, non-alignment was in a world in which you had two superpowers. Mm. Today, it's a very different world. Certainly. You know, so instead of non-alignment, Foreign Minister Jayashankar talks about multi-alignment. Mm. You know, that we have to do it on a very practical basis. I mean, for example, a leading country in the non-aligned movement was India. Mm. You take Palestine, the non-aligned movement was always behind the Palestinians. India is pro-Israel. Mm. Sri Lanka is talking about sending, what, 10,000 farmhands yes. or whatever it is to Israel. to Israel. So it's a very practical thing that, you know, seems to have taken precedence. But if we can get that into a proper doctrine, mm. then everyone will be aware of where we are going, where we are heading. And the other point, I think, is, of course, is that <coughs> To the extent that this region is going to continue to be important, we have to come up, I think, with sort of rules mm. of sort of rule-based competition between India and China. I don't think there's going to be conflict. Yes. But there has to, for example, this whole thing about research ships mm. coming in. Now we've declared a moratorium. Yes. But we can't just keep declaring a moratorium. We have to come up with a clear-cut policy in terms of what our position 
is going to be. So the pragmatism of the current government, I think, is to be commended, mm. but would like to see it being Evolving. put into a proper doctrine. My guests this evening were Dr. Parker Soti Saravanabuttu, Executive Director, Centre for Policy Alternatives and also a co-convener of the Centre for Monitoring Election Violence, as well as Mr. Manzula Gazanayaka, Institute for Democratic Reforms and Electoral Studies. Thank you very much to both of you gentlemen joining me this evening, enlightening me and also our viewers on uh, everything ranging from politics to social democracy and also the realm of foreign policy that is unfortunately all the time we have this evening for face to face do take care and have yourselves a great night